are you? Oh, it's, there it is. It's fine. Fine. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and then questions. Um, I, I kind of like it when questions are asked at the end. Otherwise, I'd lose my train of thought, and it's really interesting. Oh, thank you so much. Let me just get this not above the. Did your emails? Oh, hello. <laughs> Don't look. Okay. Okay. And then. Presentation mode, that should work. Right? Woohoo, not bad. Okay, so um, that link right there is to where these slides are. These are rendered using Hieroglyph, which is a Sphinx plugin run by Nathan Yergler, who used to work at Eventbrite until just a month or so ago, which kind of upsets me. Um, and the reason why is, as you can see on the bottom, um, on June 3rd, I start at Eventbrite. Um, I am a co-author of Two Scoops of Jenny, and this is the, the hardcover that we just got in this week. Maybe David Beasley has seen it. I don't know if you know who David Beasley is. He's like a hero and icon for all of us. But um, yeah, you guys are seeing the, the hardcover, like the first people besides Audrey May. Um, and then they have these books here. This is like, they need to move these. They, they paid for these, so, <laughs> <laughs> so buy them. Um, <laughs> Just to let you know, um, I, this is a quick advertisement for their books that they bought from us. Um, and if they run out, we have some extras that we brought. We are not planning a 1.7 or 1.8 version or 1.9 version. Maybe we'll do a 2.0, but don't count on it. It's pretty well future. She's nodding now. So it's pretty well future proofed. And, and the quick answer for the 1.7 stuff, the app cache and the migrations, I can tell you what the best practices are going to be. With migrations, don't. Don't do anything crazy, keep it simple. And for app cache, don't do anything crazy, keep it simple. Right? So. <laughs> but don't worry, someone you know who is really brilliant and clever will come up with something absolutely brilliant and clever that no one can maintain. And especially them as they move on to something else. So, um, like I am a principal at Cartwheel Web, um, and there's my book. Okay. So, um, this talk is about web. Uh, and webhooks are really neat. Recently, I've had an internal internal project to cart build needs them, and then there's some other stuff that looks like is coming down my way that's working with webhooks. So I, I started to dig into what webhooks are, and this is the formal definition of webhooks, and I'm going to read it to you in a very serious voice. Um, it is webhooks are a method of augmenting or altering the behavior of a web page or web application with custom callbacks. It's it's really serious and heavy. And, and kind of like really rich food, um, which fortunately is served all over the world. Um, but it's hard to it's hard to digest, and I, I'm not even going to bother with the second bullet um, because it's. It, and I'm not even going to try and reword it because it's it's not going to. I can't figure it out that way. I have to look at an example. And I'm going to use Django packages. Who here uses Django packages or knows what it is? Okay. So Django Packages is a site that Audrey and I came up with for Django-2010, which uh, allows you to research Django Packages. We pull information from GitHub, from Bitbucket, maybe GitLab and Git Gitorious in the future, as well as the Python package index. There's a lot of hard metrics in there. And then also people can add in non-hard metrics, which are basically descriptions and features and stuff. But there is a kernel of hard metrics that you can rely on. And the way it gets this information is it grabs from all these sources and it pulls it in and aggregates it. And once a day, or actually it's spread over two times a day, we pull in um, a lot of requests. And we used to bring down GitHub with it <laughs> until Chris Weinstrap sent me an email saying, can you guys like slow it down? So um, now they could handle it, but it's still, it's a long process. Um, and yeah, I guess we could do it asynchronously and whatever. but. I just haven't bothered. But so to, to handle all 2,300 uh, repos that we have on the system, it, it takes about 7,000 requests just to get up. And then we also hammer the Python package index. Um, we moved it off the hour because they were complaining about that. Um, so the thing is, is how, how do we fix this? And um, what we did is we. Uh, what if we could, for example, every time I pushed a repo, in this case DJ Stripe, which is my Stripe integration package, if every time I pushed it on GitHub, GitHub would let Django packages know that there was an update. 
it, it sent me a, a dictionary of information in JSON um, that represented commit.push. And uh, Travis also uses this, not just Django packages, everything, tons of things use it. And for us, just off of this one thing, we basically halved how many, how many times we were hitting GitHub per day just by adding this service. This is how miraculous of a transformation is. And this is the first pass, and we're, we're considering what else we want to grab, but there's only, we only get so much time to work on it. And so the way webhooks work then is instead of Django packages reaching out to GitHub and checking all 2,300 repos that are linked to it, um, what if instead GitHub let us know when there is a change? What if we could get the Python package index to know that when there is a change? That would be awesome. Um, and so it's kind of, webhooks are, are push or pull depending on where you stand. If you're the one who's serving out the webhook, it's a push. If you're receiving it, it's a pull. Um, so it's kind of like the inverse or opposite. I don't know which, what's the right definition of, that, of, of an API, of the traditional API. Um, so um, there's a site called resthooks.org and they say they see a 66 times improvement over using the API stuff. And I'm not sure how they cook that up, but it's impressive sounding. So I put it on the slide uh, with the caveat. Um, and that kind of sums it up. You're not constantly polling the server. If you have an iPad app or a mobile app, it's you know, where you're pushing instead of having it constantly transferring over the wire. So the Django packages example, inside of Django packages, this is, by the way, I'm getting into how this works. This is a simple function based view um, that we added. And um, what it does is when GitHub does a push to a URL that we specify, we take the data that they give and then we include that, we include that data, the commit data into our system. And this is really nice because GitHub's commit list only has 35 entries when you, the last 35 when you pull GitHub. And that's kind of a problem because in a sprint on core Django, there might be 500 commits in a day. So we will actually lose data. But fortunately, because of this, we can capture everything. We're really excited about that. Because um, more data is always good. No one compl never complains about not having enough data, right? Um, so these are instructions. I'm not going to go over them. But you can actually add, you can go to your project on GitHub. We haven't done Bitbucket yet, because nobody's asked. Um, <laughs> uh, you can go to your project right now and add the webhook. And these are just some simple instructions on, on how to do it. But, or you can be lazy like me. And what I do is I go to my settings and I, you know where services are on, in GitHub, right? For those of you who use GitHub. You can search under Django packages. Um, Audrey wrote a GitHub service, at, which was done in Ruby, and, and I helped her a little bit. And this way, it's, it's right in there. You don't even need to add in the webhook like I have to do with requires.io. I just pull up Django packages and Django package. Or I add that as a service, and then um, GitHub and Django packages takes care of the rest for you. The thing that's really awesome about this is the developer experience. Us using this as users is awesome. Um, they give us, when you're adding a webhook, they give us introspection tools so we can see, hey, is this webhook actually arriving? When's the last time they tried it? Uh, what kind of response do we get? And so we can match that against our logs. So it's, it's this really nice ex experience. And the thing about it, there's a lot of stuff that's happening under the hood that's really well done that um, is, is a little bit more complex than that looks. And I'll go into that. But anyway, as you can see, webhooks are awesome. <coughs> they, they slow down how much load your servers have. They make everything seem more responsive. Things are updated more constantly, going back and forth. If you combine it with an API, if, you, if you're serving out webhooks and also have an API, it's great. So, um, and, and then, of course, receiving them is, is easy. You just write a receiver view. You, Stripe has them. Gumroad has them. GitHub has them. Bitbucket has them. GitLab has them. Um, a lot of systems have webhooks now. But the, the thing is, is Receiving them is really, really easy. Uh, the, the big question, though, when I started this is, what about writing a system to serve them? So it's, and the thing is, it's, it's 
it's easy, right? You just you just use Python requests by tenant rights. You send out a response and you're done, right? So if, if uh, um, Trey um, does an action on a site and he um, hits submit, it should then just send out immediately to the you know the webhook to whatever target site it's supposed to hit and update it and it's done, right? It's it's really really easy. Um, <laughs> it's never that case, right? So one of the things you have to do when you're building webhooks is you have to plan for failure. There are tons of failures. It's, it's like any other integrated system. Um, you, when I'm trying to send, when Trey, for example, is trying to send out, it, it hits that submit button, how do we track what failures he has? What, what mechanism do we do? Because request doesn't handle it. That's not request's job. How many push failures do we have? Um, or do we allow? Do we allow it to try five or ten or twenty? And in what space? What span of time? If if I get twenty attempts against another server and that server is having problems, um, and I've got all these webhooks coming from my system to that system, that's that's a dog pile. That's not really nice to the other people. So, um, how do you space the uh, the attempts? Um, and yeah, and how many failures do you allow? And then how do you notify? Uh, the person who's trying to interact with the system on both sides that there's a problem, both on the receiver and the pusher. So yeah, this is this is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> um, the other thing is webhooks. When you interact with the webhook, for example, with GitHub, they wrote that with us in mind. Everybody in this room, uh, Bitbucket also does it. Stripe, Coinbase. When they write their system for us to interact with it. They're trying to come up with the developer friendly tools and we are really persnickety. We are really cynical. We're highly critical, so you have to get it right. Developers don't like to fool around. We get frustrated really fast. And then we rant on Twitter, your stock goes down. It's just, um, it's bad all around. Um, uh, also, for example, with Stripe and Coinbase, those are financially based systems. So with GitHub, if we lose a commit push, eh, who cares, right? For Stripe, uh, for, for Coinbase, for LeanPub, for Gumroad, all these systems which have webhooks where there's money involved, it's some really serious business. If you're building a medical system, right, and you're worried about HIPAA compliance, um, it, it, it can take on legal ramifications. So you kind of have to get this right. Um, writing tests for this. Uh, do you write unit tests or functional tests? Unit tests are where it's entirely contained, right? It's like you're mocking up the request target. Here's my um, You're mocking up a request thing. It's not affecting the outside world. Or do you actually hit a target? Um, and I'll go over my preference for this soon. Um, and of course, there's latency, lag, whatever we call it these days, um, performance. Um, the Python request library is fast, but HTTP itself is slow. You gotta send out the stuff over the wire. It has to arrive. We're not using UDP, so we get a handshake back that takes time. Um, if I'm if I hit the submit button, I have to wait for my stuff, or Trey has to wait for his stuff to come to my system and then get a response back. He'll be like, "Oh, this is slow," right? And he's right. It is slow. And this is especially before the system appears to update. Also, when you're constructing the uh, the data that's supposed to go out uh, that takes time because sometimes it's not just hitting a super optimized database a lot of times you're performing various calculations um, and then of course logging the results after you get the results back did it hit or not that takes time so yeah there's there's lots of things I, I could spend the whole day just describing the issues that can come up with web helps. So with all this in mind, I wrote down a list of what I thought were requirements, and I started to work on my library. And what I wanted was a library that I could use in multiple projects, and not just with Django, because Django isn't everything. Um, it's just a small, it's just the presentation layer of, of a lot of different things. Um, and we do a lot of pure Python stuff or um, things that aren't touching Django. So it's really important that I have something that works great in pure Python as well as work in Django. So these were the things that I came up with a list of requirements and I came up with design considerations. These were things where if I wanted to work with this or have other people work with it, I wanted it to, to be intuitive and easy. And so I'm not going to go through the list um, 
spell it in less because that'll get boring. Um, but, uh, oops, yeah, I did spell that right. <laughs> One of the things that's really important to me is, in addition to have a good API and all that, a good API and make it easy to debug and find stuff, is I want something where, who here does Flask or Bottle or Tornado? Raise your hand. It's okay. I, I love those libraries. Okay. Uh, or or SciPy or, or um, PyDate, you know, Pandas or something like that. Um, I want something where you can look at this library and in 10, maybe half an hour, right? Well, I guess if you're using Pandas and you really know what you're doing, it's about 10 minutes. Um, I want something where in that amount of time you can look at the library, you can, and then you can write a custom sender for your system using these, you know, using the core webhooks library. Um, I don't think I'm there yet, but that's my target. And so yeah, I wanted senders easy to write, I wanted it extendable, I want it to be really testable, and have it run fast. So here's a problem. <laughs> Whenever you come with a project, you know, it's one of the hardest things in computer science is naming. How do you name things? And unfortunately, hooks is a Webhooks is a terrible, terrible name. Uh, um, I'm not going to go into what the third bullet means because we have polite company in the room. <laughs> but this is something, and I don't think Audrey knows. I developed this. But usually I tell you everything. <laughs> but the thing is, is you, you, yeah, you want to name things that are intuitive and non-offensive and yet have meaning. And so actually, this was kind of challenging, and we'll see where I went. Okay, so, so did I get it to be what I want? Um, let's, let's go into what I did. This is the current API design. I'm not saying this is a great API design, I'm saying decorators are great for API design. And I'm gonna stand up here. Um, can I stand up this? You can, but it moves, so okay. it's not easier to the floor. Okay, I won't move that. So yeah, these are the imports of a couple pieces. I have a decorator, a webhook decorator, and I assign a sender callable. In this case, a targeted sender um, requires a URL variable, um, a URL argument. In this case, I hit HTTP bin. And then I define a function. I pass in you know, the, the required argument, which is URL. I pass in uh, the, the, the name of the wife, the name of the husband, which you can see is actually used there. But then all I have to re return is a dictionary, a, a JSON serial well, JSON serializable? Yeah, a JSON, uh, a dictionary that can become JSON. <laughs> um, and, that, and we have it working with date times and decimals, so you're not just limited to stock JSON, the Python stock JSON library. And this is it, this is the API. And so if you were going to extend this, um, you know, all you really have to do in most cases, unless you want to get a little bit fancy, which I'll get into, is define a new sender callable. And I'll get into that. But what I like about this is, is the API is simple. Even if, oh, that's not my shoes. Um, even if you don't dig into the library yourself, let's say you wrote a custom sender callable, then you can hand it out to your developers and say, okay, use this sender, you know, use the webhooks with this sender callable and take care of all the hard, heavy lifting. And I, I really like that, because it, it means webhooks suddenly are, are, are much faster to write. And this is the results of what I get back for this example. I think this is current. So there's a hash. It's the third, fourth line down. Um, I have highlighting later. So this hash uh, uh, is a unique value for this attempt, attempt number one. Of, uh, of so that way you know you can you can track it and whatever system you have. The response I snipped it because otherwise it just go off the screen. But it includes all the data, include, including the status kit. Um, and you can tell if you know anything about Python 3 and this, I work in a lot of Python 3, so that's why it's, it's a bytes thing. Um, okay, so the way, the way you define the hooks, um, you can see that webhook on you know, that hook dec webhook decorator, is I have a, a base hook, okay? Um, and this is a decorator um, that, um, you, who here knows what Python decorators are? Okay, excellent, that, that speeds things up. Um, to, to simplify constructing this decorator, I use Graham Dumbleton's wrap 